In this video, I'm going to talk about continuous functions. Well, there are many ways of defining continuous functions in mathematics, and one measure of your progress in mathematics is sort of how many different ways of defining continuity do I know? In this video, we're going to learn one of the more familiar ways of defining continuity, and that's called the epsilon delta definition of continuity. So let's talk about continuity, but first we're going to need a function. We're going to use a type of function that by now is becoming pretty familiar. That's a function that goes from the real numbers into the real numbers. Its inputs are real numbers and its outputs are real numbers. And in one of my previous videos, we saw an absolutely brilliant way of representing this function graphically. And that was to draw the real number line horizontally to represent the domain, which is the set of inputs of the function, and then draw a real number line vertically to represent the range, which is the set of outputs of the function. And as the input moves along the domain, the output moves along the range, and this creates a line that traverses the space between the two axes. So the x-axis here is the domain and the y-axis is the range. Then the line shows us where the input of the function meets the output. Now this line that I've drawn is quite smooth and I haven't had to take my pen off the page to draw it. And this is the very first sort of layman's definition of continuity you're going to come across, which is a continuous function is one that you can draw without taking your pen off the page. So I've been able to draw this function without taking my pen off the page, and it looks pretty continuous to me. So let's have a look at what a discontinuous function looks like. Clearly, a discontinuous function is one you can draw only by taking your pen off the page. But actually, there's some restriction about how exactly we can take our pen off the page. For example, if I try and draw this function, where the function is continuous up to the number 2, and then suddenly jumps from 2 to 4, is that a valid discontinuous function? Well, no, it isn't, because for example, what is the value of the function at 3? And a function has to be defined for every value of its input. So the fact that there is no answer for 3 means that this isn't really a function we're dealing with. So if we want to have a discontinuous function, we can't have a horizontal jump in it, because then there are some inputs to the function that don't have an output. And the whole reason why we restrict functions to operating between sets is that we know that for every element in that input set, there will be a corresponding output. So we can't have this horizontal jump. But what we can have is a vertical jump. So this graph does represent a valid function. And what I've tried to draw here is this left branch of the function going up to the number 4, then the output jumps from somewhere around 2, suddenly up to somewhere around 3, and then the function continues on. So there's no gap in the horizontal direction. The value of the function at 4 is 2, and then, as soon as I step even the tiniest bit beyond 4, then I've suddenly jumped from the left-hand branch of the function up to the right-hand branch of the function. So I'm moving from an output that's somewhere around 2 to an output that's suddenly somewhere around 3. And we can represent this on the graph by drawing a little cross over the lower left-hand branch of the function and a circle around the upper right-hand branch of the function. This cross and circle indicate that at the value of 4, my function has the value at the cross, but as soon as we go the tiniest bit beyond the value 4, the function jumps up to the value 3. If we draw the cross at the top right part of the graph, and the circle at the bottom left part of the graph, then that would mean that at the input of 4, the output of the function is somewhere around 3, and as soon as we go a little lower than 4, the output of the function will be on the lower left branch of the graph, and so the value of the function at 4 would be 3, but then as soon as I go to a little bit less than 4, it will be back down at 2 again. But we've chosen to go for the other way around. And the question is, how are we going to define mathematically whether the function is continuous or discontinuous? And the way we do it involves lots of epsilons and deltas, and so it's called the epsilon delta definition of continuity. And this definition of continuity only tells you about the continuity of the function at a single point. So we want to look at the continuity at a point c, where c represents an unspecified point. Let's first look at a point that we do think is continuous. Let's look at c equals 2. Then the value of the function at c looks like it's about 1.2. And I like to think of the epsilon delta definition of continuity as like playing a game. It's very similar to the game we played when we were trying to determine the convergence of sequences. And the game goes like this. Firstly, your friend picks a small positive number, which we represent by the symbol epsilon. Let's say he picks the value 0.5. And then we're going to draw on the graph two horizontal lines that represent different numbers in the range or in the output of this function. One we're going to draw at f of c plus epsilon, and then the other we're going to draw at f of c minus epsilon. 
So the first is going to be somewhere around 1.7, and the second is going to be somewhere around 0.7. Now you have to pick a small positive number, and we call that number delta. Let's suppose you pick delta equals 0.3, and in this case we're going to draw two vertical lines. So these lines correspond to points in the domain. So I'm going to draw one line at C plus delta and another line at C minus delta. We're going to look at values of the function in between those two lines, C plus delta and C minus delta. We can see that the function inside those two lines never goes above or below the two red lines defined by your friend's value of epsilon. If we look at numbers around 4 and 5 on the x-axis in the domain, the function is above the red line f of C plus epsilon. But we're only looking at the value of the function in between those two pink lines, defined by your value of delta. And in those two lines, the function never goes outside the two red lines defined by your friend's epsilon. How are we going to describe this mathematically? If p is any number in between c plus delta and c minus delta, then the value of the function at that p is never going to be above the value of f of c plus epsilon and never going to be below the value of f of c minus epsilon. So firstly we need to make sure p remains between those two pink lines. And that means that the distance between p and c is going to be less than delta. So we say if the distance between p and c is less than delta, then the distance between f of p and f of c is going to be less than epsilon. So those two red lines are epsilon distance away from f of c. The two purple lines are delta distance away from c. If the distance between p and c is less than delta, that just means that if p is in between the two pink lines, then the distance between f of p and f of c is less than epsilon. And in this case, you win this round of the game. Because you want that condition to be true, and your friend wants that condition to be false. So your friend is going to pick a smaller value of epsilon. And what that's going to do is it's going to move those two red lines closer to the value of f of c. You can see that when he does that, if we keep the same value of delta, there's going to be portions of this function that are above f of c plus epsilon and that are below f of c minus epsilon. So in this case, our condition is false. We can pick p equal to something like 2.3, then we'll find that the distance between f of p and f of c is greater than epsilon. So we need to try and make this condition true again, and it's our turn to change the value of delta. So we're going to pick a smaller delta and that's going to bring in these two pink lines closer to the value of c. Now if we look at the portion of the function between those two pink lines, we can see that it's not going outside the two red lines defined by the value of epsilon. And what you might be able to see is that no matter how small your friend picks his value of epsilon, you're always going to be able to pick a value of delta such that this is true. There's no restriction on how small you can pick delta. So we can keep going and going smaller and smaller and smaller, and your friend can keep going smaller and smaller and smaller. But we're always going to be able to satisfy this condition if we pick delta small enough. And since we can do it for every value of epsilon, so if whatever your friend picks, we can get this condition to be true by picking an equivalently small value of delta, then we say that the function is continuous at c equals 2. So at this point 2, the function is continuous. If we try and write that down in a single sentence in English, we'll come up with something like this. If for all positive epsilon there exists a positive delta such that when the distance between our point p and c is less than delta then the distance between f of p and f of c is less than epsilon so the last part of that line is the one that says that if p is between those two pink lines then f of p is going to be between the two red lines then we say that f is continuous at c so that's the case if no matter what epsilon your friend picks you'll always be able to find that delta and we can write this in shorthand mathematical notation. So many of you all have seen this before. For all becomes an upside down a, and there exists becomes a backwards e. So if for all epsilon greater than zero, there exists delta greater than zero, such that p minus c is less than delta implies f of p minus f of c is less than epsilon, then f is continuous at c. So this is just a shorthand mathematical way of writing it, which is quicker than writing out the full thing. Well, that tells us about continuity, but we drew this function in such a way that it was discontinuous at the point c equals 4. So let's look at that point, let's look at c equals 4, and see what happens to our definition of continuity. We know that that condition can't be true because that condition is only true for continuous things, and we're looking at something that's discontinuous. There's got to be something that goes wrong. 
When C equals 4, f of C looks to be around 2.1. And we're simply going to play the game again. If your friend picks a value of epsilon equal to 1, for example. Now we know the procedure. We draw the two red lines, one at 3.1 and one at 1.1, representing f of C plus epsilon and f of C minus epsilon. And then we pick our delta. Let's pick delta equals 0.2. And that defines the two pink lines that are delta away from the value of c. So one's going to be at 4.2 and the other's going to be at 3.8. c plus delta and c minus delta. And you can see that between the two pink lines that we've defined by our delta, the function never goes outside the two red lines defined by our friends epsilon. So our condition is again true. If the distance between p and c is less than delta, then the distance between f of c and f of p is less than epsilon. But now comes the trick. Your friend picks a value of epsilon equal to 0.3. And now you can see that the upper red line is between the two branches of the function. So when we jump from the value at 4 up to the branch of the function at the top right, then we're going to jump from a value of the output around 2.1 suddenly up to an output that's somewhere around 3. And no matter how small we get to find delta, we can move to the right half that distance, so we can move to the right delta over 2. And we're going to jump from the lower section of the function up to the upper section of the function. Because no matter how small we pick delta, we can always divide delta by 2. And then by moving that distance, half of delta, to the right, so we get 4 plus delta over 2, we're moving from the lower left branch of the function to the upper right branch of the function, and we're jumping from somewhere around 2 up to somewhere around 3. And so we're going to jump over this red line. And this is how we catch discontinuities. We're going to jump outside this area defined by the two epsilons. And there's nothing we can do about it. There's no delta we can pick where we won't make that jump. And so the condition on the right is never going to be true. So no matter what value of delta we pick, there's always going to be a point where the distance between f of p and f of c is greater than epsilon. So the condition can't be true. And that's exactly how we catch the discontinuity. So we can say that f is discontinuous at c equals 4. So our function is continuous at the point 2, but discontinuous at the point 4. Now, what if we have a function that's continuous at every point, so it doesn't have a discontinuity anywhere? That means the function, f from r to r, is continuous for all points c in the real numbers. Then we say that f is a member of the set of continuous functions, and we denote the set of continuous functions by a capital C with a superscript 0 at the top. And we'll see what that superscript zero means in a future video. But if f is a member of the set of continuous functions, that means that f is continuous. Now, I have a problem for you, and I think this is quite a tough problem. So, good luck. I'm going to define a function, a function that goes from the real numbers into the real numbers. And I'm going to define it in two parts. So I'm going to say that the function is equal to x if x is less than zero. But if x is greater than or equal to zero, then the value of the function is going to be equal to 1 plus x. And notice that I've said greater than or equal to 0, because if I just said greater than 0, then the value of the function at the point 0 would be undefined. And like I said before, we can't have a point in the input set that doesn't have a corresponding value in the output set. I've had to define this function in two pieces because I can't think of a, well, continuous way of doing it. So <laughs> that gives the game away a bit. This function is discontinuous. And if you look at the graph, you can clearly see that's the case. We have the line of f of x equals x just going almost all the way to 0. And then starting at 0, we have the line of f of x equals 1 plus x. And a function that looks like this, that's been defined in this way in two pieces, is called a piecewise function. And they're perfectly acceptable functions, except they're probably discontinuous. My question actually involves sequences. So hopefully you remember about sequences or you've watched my video because we're going to look at two sequences that I've introduced before. The first sequence is a n. The nth element in the sequence is equal to 1 over 2 to the power n. This is a sequence that converges to 0. And we're also going to look at the sequence b n where the nth term of b is simply the negative of the nth term of a. So the nth term of b is equal to minus 1 over 2 to the n. Those are the two sequences I want to remind you of. We're going to look at what happens to those sequences when we put them inside a function. So that means we're defining a new sequence, a sequence of f of a n, where the first few terms of the sequence goes f a 1, f a 2, f a 3, dot 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 dot. And my question is, what does this sequence converge to? And I want you to do the same for f of b n. What does that limit converge to? 
Do they converge to the same thing? Do they converge to different things? And what do you suspect the relationship is between the values of the limit and the continuity or discontinuity of a function?